welcome, good evening, dear friends and colleagues. Um, uh, to this uh, first session of the additional program to the 15th edition of the Congress on Musical, International Congress on Musical Signification that Professor Ero Tarasti has been leading for more than 30 years now. Um, I would like to present to you the three keynote lectures that we have organized and that were broadcasting live from the uh, Scuola Superior de Musica de Catalunya in Barcelona as a kind of atonement for the twice uh, postponement that we had to do. First, the Congress was meant to take place in September 20. Then we adjourned it to now, September 21. Then we had to adjourn it a second time. That was painful, twice painful. But now um, we do hope we will all meet together in June 22, whether with masks or without them. So tonight we have uh, the um, uh, Dr. Raul Garriga Seitz uh, introduction to Catalonia. Um, that is one of many possible answers to the frequent question by international colleagues about our country, or should we say, our project of a country. Tomorrow it is um, um, Joan Vidal and Mark Horn's presentation of the successful and really exciting experiences um, teaching musical signification to young teenagers in conservatoires. And last not least, on Friday, always at 6 p.m. local time, Luca Chiantore is sharing some of his discoveries um, with new repertoire. Um, that is, uh, the, the musical, um, the, the piano works of uh, a composer called Hélène de Mongeau at the turn of the 19th century. Um, I want to thank first the uh, Escola Superior de Musica de Catalunya and its uh, general director, Nuria Sampera, who's been supportive all the time uh, to these activities. And then our collaborators and friend, uh, fellow travelers in, in these activities, uh, Dr. Rolf Becker, Dr. Melissa Marcadal, um, Rosa Roda, Mireia Cañadas, um, uh, Adrián García, Jaume Cortacans, Monse Urpi. Um, many thanks to them all. And of course, thank you very much also for attending, whether live or online. Um, it was quite a shock to see the list of uh, inscribed people from literally all around the world. So um, thank you very much for being there. And I give you Dr. Melissa Marcadal, our head of uh, academic activities. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Dr. Grimal, for the organization of these three lectures, very special lectures. And it's an honor for me to introduce uh, the speaker, the presenter of this evening um, lecture, Dr. Raul Garriga Zaid, who is a writer and Hellenist. In his essays, he has explored topics such as cosmopolitanism, Santiago Rossignol, and the arrival of modernity in Catalonia. The relationship between Greco-Latin classics and power and the dangers and potentialities of anger. His novel, Els Estranys, from 2017, translated into English as The Others, was awarded some of the most important prizes in Catalan literature. 
Moving between reflection and narrative, Raoul has built a work that uses elements of a long literary and philosophical tradition to question some of the idols and discomforts of modernity. In his book, The Founders, from 2020, Gabi Gassai describes the history and circumstances of the Bernat Media Foundation, of which he is the director. This foundation has been offering Catalan translations of Greco-Latin classics for almost a hundred years. Beyond the historical portrait, his text helps to understand the humanistic basis of, on which modern Catalan culture has been built, and that is also at the heart of current debates around the cultural and political future of Catalonia. Welcome, please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Garigazai. We are looking forward to your presentation. Thank you for being here. much, Melissa. Um, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me, uh, and especially uh, Dr. Joan Grimal. Um, well, I've been assigned a difficult, uh, perhaps impossible task. Explain what Catalonia is in 50 minutes to an audience composed of people from many different countries. It's a difficult task, not merely because of the time constraint. Is it actually possible to define a piece of land a linguistic community, a culture, a nation? And can one really hope to find within all of this a coherence that has not only lasted over time, but also remained rooted in the geography? These aren't questions that can be simplified or answered flippantly. In order to understand reality, we must first classify it. But we are condemned to always omit important elements. Standing before you today, then I have no option but to present a drastic selection. I'll do so by concentrating on three or four figures and the one specific sensibility that unites them, a sensibility that, in my opinion, is still relevant to our day and age. And by the way, I have to say that there's an official title, Catalonia, an introduction, and there's an unofficial title, which is Elevation and Rootedness, Notes on a Catalan Mentality. <clears throat> to begin with, allow me to take you on a journey through one of Barcelona's most visited attractions, one of those locations that run the risk of turning into mere decoration for passers-by. I'm uh, referring to Park Güell. At the turn of the 20th century, the entire area was outside the city of Barcelona and known by the rather striking name of Montaña Palada or Bear Mountain. The industrialist and philanthropist Tauzari Güell purchased two tracts of land there with the idea of constructing a large urban development and gave the job of drawing up the plans to the architect, Antoni Gaudí. The original idea was to build on 60 individual plots, plots of land, homes with an abundance of natural light and views of the city. However, the plots were never sold and the original plan fell through. But this failure proved a stroke of luck because out of it was born a 17 hectare public park. Bear Mountain was a dry, rocky wasteland. A wasteland with a steep gradient, but it's these specific features that give the park its form. Gaudí refused to flatten it. He was eager to utilize the abruptness of its slopes and accept the land as a gift from nature. Thus, in order to save the slope from obliteration, he designed paths that snaked and spiraled. Inside the park, we find columns that lean heavily to one side, helical pillars with capitals shaped like mushrooms, and winding walls and benches. Everything has the feeling of a mountain having been sculpted out of the original mountain's forms. 
What's more, the architect obtained material for all the park's constructions directly from the land and the surrounding terrain. Not only was the perimeter wall built using stone from the mountainside, but the builders were instructed to collect any tiles or bottles they might find al along the paths and tracks. These materials would later serve for the roofs and handrails, all of which are made using a technique called uh, trencadis. Trencadis will be an important word in, in my talk. Trencadis are pieces of ceramic, uh, marble, and glass set with lime mortar in an, in, in an art form that can be considered a genuine precursor of uh, avant-garde collage. Each of these works, these trencadis works, used discarded materials which conserved their original character while being transformed into something new. This is where Gaudí's exceptional collaborator, the architect and designer Josep Maria Jujol, really excelled even going as far as incorporating crockery from his own home into the park's creations. So when, when we go to uh, Park Güell, we actually see what Jose Maria Jujol could see in his home every day. Despite being formed by scraps of waste material, Trencadis is successful in creating a bright, luminous beauty. And one could even talk of a philosophy of Trencadis that consists in taking the loveliest most scorned objects from your immediate surroundings, bottles, ceramic, tiles, and regarding them with enough charity to transform them into something beautiful and of service. My use of the word charity is no coincidence. Gaudí and Jujol were devout Catholics and perceived the world as divine revelation. Therefore, any material they chanced upon, no matter how insignificant, was capable of possessing a profound truth. Finding a role for it meant they were collaborating with creation, with capital C. Entering Park Güell, we're immediately greeted by two cottage-style houses. The one to our left has a tall tower culminating in a Greek cross while the one to our right is crowned by an Amanita muscaria, a hallucinogenic mushroom with a long tradition in European folklore, which naturally includes Catalonia, a country with a long-standing passion for mushrooms. Thus, flanked by Christian redemption and earthly hallucination, we enter Gaudí's world. First, we come to a monumental stairway a tondo with the four blood-soaked bars of the Catalan coat of arms, and a snake's head. Slightly further up is another reptile, a dragon, or lizard perhaps, staring us down while it clutches the handrails as if defending the site. At the very top of the stairs, we enter a hypostyle chamber with 86 Doric columns, and continuing our ascent, we arrive at a large square bordered by one continuous undulating bench made of trencadis, the delightful result of Jujol's extraordinary vision. Gaudí christened this vast area as the Greek theater and positioned it at the foot of the slope as was customary with the orchestra or scenic space in ancient theaters. Keeping in mind that the Greek word theatron, theatron means a place for contemplation. The square also offers magnificent views of Barcelona, framed by the cross and the psychotropic mushroom. As I've already mentioned, Bear Mountain didn't contain a drop of water. Gaudí solved this with a small architectural masterpiece. Rather than cementing the square, he would allow the water to filter through the ground. Underneath, a receptacle would collect and guide the water towards the hollow Doric columns, and via the columns into an underground tank. When the tank was full, the water would pour out of two overflow channels, the mouths of the dragon and the snake that guard the splendid stairway. It's not difficult to sense the site's dense symbolism. 
Ancient mythology abounds with dragons defending fountains, the most famous being the dragon at Delphi in Greece. The guardian of water slayed by the god Apollo so he could establish his oracle there. Just as with Parguel, the temple of Delphi had a theater, Doric columns, and was built on sloping terrain, in this case at the foot of Mount Parnassus. The story goes that Apollo's high priestess would sit on a tripod in order to enter into a trance, which is why at the very top of the sweeping Parguel stairway we find a strange three-legged figure made of trancadis, a kind of tripod. Near to the temple of Apollo in Delphi, one could contemplate a stone known as Omphalos, the navel of the world. With direct allusions to Delphi, Gaudí was sending a daring message, an idea in, uh, formed in equal measure by creative energy and hallucination, and hallucination. Here, at this exact point of the primordial Montaña Palada, this was Gaudí's message, here is the center of the world, in the same way as Delphi was the center of the world in ancient Greece. And Catalonia, this was also uh, Gaudí's message, a fusion of Hellenic and Christian legacies is the new Greece. But why such heightened affection for a dry, rocky wasteland and its unexpected elevation to the level of universal meaning? Up to a point, these were the two fundamental concepts of Catalan modernity between the years 1868 to 1939. These two concepts, I mean, the affection for a dry, rocky wasteland and the elevation to a universal meaning. Um, to understand them, it's worth focusing on two specific phenomena, the fascination with the notion of Greece and the linguistic reality experienced by Catalans. <clears throat> I'll begin with Greece. Gaudí enjoyed saying such things as the following. My Greek qualities are on account of the Mediterranean, the vision of which constitutes a necessity for me. I need to see the sea often, and most Sundays I go down to the breakwater. The sea is the only thing that synthesizes all three dimensions of space. The sun is reflected on its surface, and through it, I spy movement and depth. But for Gaudí, the Mediterranean wasn't just any sea. It was something different. He used to say, virtue is in the mean. Mediterranean means the middle of the earth. Its shorelines with the light at 45 degrees, the angle that best outlines bodies and exhibits their forms, is the place where all great artistic cultures have flourished for the very reason that the balance of light in the Mediterranean establishes the definitive vision of things within which all authentic art must reside. Our plastic strength is the balance between emotion and logic. In other words, according to Gaudí, the people of the Mediterranean have a privileged sensitivity because they receive sunlight at the ideal angle. On the other hand, those from the north, and uh, allow me to take this opportunity to greet our colleagues from Northern Europe present here today. So uh, those from the north are unable to achieve a similar level of aesthetic sensitivity and thus incapable of appreciating beauty with such definition and intensity. Seeing only ghosts amid the fog, northerners take refuge in abstract thought which is why they excel in analysis, science, and industry. This, this is, these are Gaudí's ideas. Eh? Uh, the architect clarified his idea in the, following day, in the following way. Fantasy belongs to the people of the North. We are more precise. Image belongs to the Mediterranean. Orestes knows where he's going. Hamlet, on the other hand, wanders lost. Gaudí undoubtedly had an eccentric character, but in his day and age, this was by no means an outlandish theory. And paradoxically, this vision has northern roots. It was the Germany of Winkelmann, Goethe, 
Wilhelm von Humboldt and the Schlegel brothers that created the spiritual dichotomy of a reflexive north full of darkness and the luminous south where beauty manifested itself like nowhere else on earth. And as the theory spread across Europe, each country appropriated it uh, in its own way. In Catalan-speaking territories, the image of both ancient Greece and the Mediterranean became nothing short of an obsession. In 1906, the poet Miquel Costa Llovera celebrated the landscape of his native Mallorca as a renewal of Greece, where the Homeric muse breathed and where one could drink the joy of life as it overflowed from the nectar cup. To him, the Mallorcan shoreline shone just as brightly as those of Attica in Greece. <clears throat> While Gaudí was working on Parguel in the north of Catalonia in what was once the ancient Greek colony of Empurias, a statue measuring 2.2 meters was discovered of the Greek god Asclepius, son of Apollo, a god capable of miraculously curing the sick. The statue was compared to the wooden sculptures of the Virgin Mary discovered in remote caves in medieval legends and which served as the center of new communities. With identical vigor, Asclepius was meant to inspire a new age of cultural renaissance. Around the same time, uh, Juan Maragall, poet, living intellectual and translator of Goethe and Nietzsche, wrote the tragedy Nausicaa, based on book six of the Odyssey. Maragall often spent his summers in the coastal village of Caldas de Strac near Barcelona, and it was there, gazing out from his house on the seafront, where he found inspiration. He wrote, My poem seems to need this view, this color, this sound of the same sea that swayed Ulysses' boat and which surrounded those heavenly islands. It's possible to find similar appropriations of Greece's symbolic capital in all Western cultures, but it's crucial to read each manifestation within its own particular context. In Catalan-speaking territories, the link to Greece satisfied a burning necessity. When intellectuals at uh, the turn of the 20th century look back, looked back, they saw a desert. They saw Catalonia as having been reduced over subsequent centuries to the status of an unambitious, powerless province, existing on the margins of great European culture. Within the hierarchy of modernity, a country without power was strictly local, turned, turned towards the past without the muscle or means to contribute anything to the world. And this was precisely the decadence that Gaudí and his contemporaries were anxious to reject. Around 1800, the German Wilhelm von Humboldt described Greece as having gone from the most particular culture in human history to the most universal. What Greece demonstrated was that by developing local traditions, a message could be sent to the whole of humanity. And this was the deep underlying meaning of the Hellenic imagery we find in the Catalonia of a hundred years ago. Greece set an example of anti-provincialism and offered a universal perspective, thus providing Catalonia with the opportunity to recover a voice capable of conversing with Europe and the world as an equal. <clears throat> The idea of Greece beamed Catalans towards the ethereal heights of the universal, as if it were a magic spell capable of making them levitate. But this elevation is only one of the two elements on display in Parkway. The other points downwards. Let us take a moment to remember the philosophy of Trencadís. However lowly it may be, however deserving of scorn it may appear, any discarded piece of glass or ceramic found on the street can be transformed 
with the loving embrace of lime mortar into a part of a useful and valuable, and valuable home. The steep, rocky mountain needn't be flattened and made to disappear because it partakes in the qualities of the very earth from which Parguel emerges. The philosophy of Trencadiz is based on the principle of accepting whatever you stumble across as possessing an inherent fecundity. Art is one thing, but is it possible to apply this idea to language? There's a famous speech um, which was held in 1903 entitled In Praise of the Word by the poet Juan Maragall. Uh, in this speech, Juan Maragall proclaimed the word as the most marvelous thing in the world because within it all of nature's corporal marvelousness and spiritual marvelousness embrace and blend into one. It's for this reason, said uh, Juan Maragall, that the spoken word with a subtle movement of air presents us with the world's in immense diversity. We tend to forget this deeper dimension of language and speak superficially, but on occasions we're reminded of its power and glory. <clears throat> when we are in love, when we are whisked away by poetic impulse, but also when we know how to pay close attention to how the lowly and the illiterate speak. With devotion, Maragall evokes the spontaneous phrases spoken by a Pyrenean shepherd, by a Provencal girl, by a Provencal girl, or a group of Cantabrian sailors. They might seem banal, but in their purity they had an epiphanic power. For the poet, the words that make the universe, that make the universe reverberate, are in the result of calculations and forethought, rather a marvelous gift handed to us. This gift manifests itself mysteriously away from power, outside of the classroom, and on the margins of dictionaries and grammar. To see it, one must possess the same receptive attitude that forms the basis of Trencadiz. Anything, however modest, can be regarded with wonder. It's highly significant that the three examples of authentic, of authentic speech given by, by Maragall, the shepherd, the girl, the sailors, are in Catalan, Provençal, and Castilian. The poet perceived, perceives universality as a, blossoming, as a blossoming of plurality, saying the one true universal expression will necessarily be as diverse as the, as the diversity of nations and their people. Maragall proposes an understanding of human diversity that goes far beyond borders and the disciplinary codifying of nation states of his day, including Spain. But this perception was necessarily born out of a specific historical context. When Juan Maragall gave this speech, Catalan wasn't only the most commonly heard language on the street and the vehicle of both traditional and modern intellectual culture, but the language that impregnated daily life in Catalan-speaking territories from French ruled northern Catalonia all the way to Valencia in the south, from the Balearic Islands to the eastern strip of Aragon. Nevertheless, there was one very specific space that remained strictly off limits. Anything that was official or related either directly or indirectly to the state excluded Catalan. And the obligatory language was Spanish in the south and French in the north. Gaudí, for one, had first experience of this. He was held in a cell for insisting on speaking Catalan to a policeman. With Catalan ex excluded from schools and other public institutions, for Maragall's generation, the language of official rhetoric, bureaucrats, and the military was Castilian. When the poet described the word as a sacred thing and explained the importance of avoiding the sacrilege of the unnatural war word, he was taking an unequivocal political and aesthetic position. In addition to placing his faith in genuine forms of expression, he was rejecting the standardizing policies of all states. During this period, Maragall used poetry to celebrate legendary popular figures 
uh, reinterpreted through a romantic lens, such as, for instance, Counter Now and Outlaw Sarayonga. Sons of the Catalan interior, they were impetuous, carnal men, marked by the conflict between desire and sin, individuals that broke through the limits and faced down the law. They reflected the very image the poet wanted to present of his compatriots at the turn of the century. Inside every Catalan was an anarchist, and the essence of the Catalan soul was liberty, according to Maragall. Indeed, Maragall's uh, Sarallonga, uh, this outlaw, proudly affirms the following. I have walked the world, the world to my own delight. I have done what pleased me every instant free, bending to no law, no king, no thing. In Maragall's idiom, each of these characters is uh, an earthly figure, a son of the earth, a son of the terra. Catalan. It's worth pausing here to consider the meaning of this very specific word. As in other Roman languages, the Catalan word terra can be translated into English in numerous ways. Earth, land, soil, country, ground, floor. And more often than not, all of these meanings are present to some degree. In the 17th century, Catalans launched an armed, an armed uprising against the Castilian monarchy in what is today known as the Reapers War on the Catalan Revolt under the rallying cry of long live the terra, death to bad government. And this dichotomy has endured over, over the centuries. Along with language, terra constitutes a direct engagement with one's daily reality, material needs, and family and community inheritance. It's a plot of soil that can be worked or a stretch of land that can be contemplated. It's the landscape of pine, oak, and gorse you'll see if you have the opportunity to travel uh, in Catalonia. But it's also the same bare, arid land that Gaudí transformed into the navel of the world. Bad government is nothing less than the political structures built in this regard of the terror and for this reason considered foreign or threatening. When Maragall asks himself and asks men, what are we if not an exalted terra? He's pointing towards this very notion I've, ju I've just explained. Genuine culture is never an artificial invention by official power, but a reality that's born organically, a fusion of language and land capable of identifying the most elevated elevated beauty in the humblest of elements, such as Gaudí with his Trencadís. This concept enables Managal to transfigure a weakness. After military defeat in 1714, Catalans lost all independent political institutions, and for years theirs was a provincial existence without a culture of power. Therefore, Maragall transforms, transforms necessity into virtue by locating within his unfavorable historical context the chance to extol spiritual freedom. Poetic transfiguration and symbolic exaltation compensated for political dissatisfaction. Juan Maragall personifies the changes and contradictions of his day like few other intellectuals of his time. In spite of the rousing mythology of all those coarse free spirits born from the land, he was a respectable father of 13 who lived in the comfortable uptown neighborhood of San Gervasi and wrote for the bourgeois press. Violent storms may have thundered within the soul of the translator of Friedrich Nietzsche, but externally, at least, his was a serene life. As the years passed, Maragall went from a fascination with savage, earthy heroes to an admiration of the harmonious forms of classical Greece, as well as the sea that unites Europe's eastern and western shores. And as he aged, he increasingly left wilder fantasies behind to embrace a Hellenic aesthetic based on order and self-restraint. Sarayonga, the outlaw, 
the indomitable outlaw, steals, disobeys, and sins. Nausicaa, the Greek girl, is sentimental, obedient, and capable of renouncing true love. This shift from disorder to form, from anarchy to a certain institutionalism, is analogous to what the entirety, entirety of Catalan culture attempts to do between 1868 and 1939. Coinciding with the growing industrialization of Catalonia, a complete European culture gradually takes shape during these years. The population of Barcelona multiplies and the city is expanded thanks to uh, the development of the Eixample district, an egalitarian grid system designed by the engineer Ildefon Cerdà. The singular buildings by Gaudí, Domènech i Montaner, and other modernist architects go up around the city. In literature, translations into Catalan of ancient and modern classics begin to appear, and there's a flowering in terms of style and genre. The crowning glories of these developments being the narrative fiction of Victor Català, the poetry of J.D. Foch, and the prose of Josep Pla, to name just a few. This is mirrored in the field of music with canonical figures <coughs> such as Frédéric Mompou and Robert Gerard, where institutions are established to nurture and promote this burgeoning culture. The Institute of Catalan Studies, the same academic entity where Pompeu Fabra defined modern standardized Catalan, is founded in 1907. Numerous obstacles were overcome to form autonomous political entities, beginning with the so-called Mancomunitat in 1914 and culminating in the Republican Generalitat in 1931. By the 1930s, Catalan culture is brimming with tension and potential and appears to be developing in a free and far-reaching manner. However, in 1936, a group of Spanish generals launched a coup against the Republic, causing a civil war that would end less than three years later in nationalist victory. The resulting fascist dictatorship established under, Fran under Francisco Franco would be like sulfuric acid for Catalan language and culture. It was as though everything had suddenly been torn down and had to be built all over again, brick by brick. But allow me to take a step backwards and focus on the composer, Frédéric Mompon, grandson of a bell founder and raised amid the dean of industrial Barcelona, Mumpo often stated that what most interested him wasn't the timber of each note played, but the precise sonorities between the notes. For him, composing meant sitting at the piano and searching for resonances, unconventional harmonies, and impressions that lasted long in the ear as something more than a, than a succession of musical vibrations. My hands are my, my music, he would say. His wasn't a frenetic fight to extract sounds from his instrument like, the one, like that of an engineer extracting raw materials from nature only to reduce them to quantifiable, to quantifiable energy. More than the imposition of his own will, Mumpo tended to regard music as a miracle that presented itself freely. He would often tell the story of how one day, while entertaining the guitarist Miquel Jouvet in his Paris apartment, he heard a few peculiar notes from under his own left hand. He made a mental note of them and later turned them into the central theme of his prelude number six, Pour la main gauche, for the left hand. In an article published in January 1930, Mumpo confessed his, uh, his inability to subject himself to the regime of the rules of composition and openly admitted that he didn't have an inner ear that, and, that, and that he wasn't interested in developing one. My intention, he wrote, has always been to create sonorities that even the most sophisticated inner ear would struggle to detect. For that reason, he never conceived his work beforehand in his mind. He wrote, my sensibility 
is a receiver antenna that dismantles elements, leaving them reduced to nothing. I write like a medium. I make music which, as it forms, guides me until it's the very music itself that decides upon the title. I don't create music, but rather music creates me. Mumpo presented himself as a sensitive and outward-looking musician, a primitivist desirous of arriving at an ideal model just like the painters who sought the same in African sculpture, a lover of clarity and conciseness, and an admirer of uh, Maurice Ravel and Stravinsky. He ended the article with a reflection on the origins of music. It's impossible to compose a sincere piece of music without it bearing the mark of its origin. That didn't lead him to composing simple harmonizations of popular songs, and it was precisely this form of decorative folklore that he had, that had to be combated, according to his view. This isn't the way to make Catalan music, he affirmed. A Catalan composition worthy of being classified as universal music will be born in our terra and of our terra. Of course, Mumpo didn't put mu did put music to a large number of traditional Catalan songs, but that wasn't the point. The point was to compose music that obtained universal status precisely because of its intense relationship with its native culture. In other words, universality and rootedness, Greece and the Bear Mountain. <clears throat> Mumpo's article was published just as the Primo de Rivera dictatorship was falling. It's, it's a previous dictatorship to Franco, Franco's one. So we had two dictatorships in the 20th century. Uh, one year and three months later, the, revolution, the revolutionary Francesc Macià won elections and declared the Catalan Republic in Barcelona. When Mumpo says his music is deeply Catalan, he's speaking from within a collective moment bubbling with energy and expectation. As on other occasions in the history of Catalonia, Macià's audacious move didn't lead to the constitution of an independent state, but instead forced the declaration of the Second Spanish Republic, within which Catalonia was officially recognized as an autonomous region. It was a fragile and hostile situation that satisfied neither Barcelona nor Madrid. Needless to say, it didn't last long. As for Mumpo, between 1930 and 1941, he went through an intense personal crisis. His friend and composer, Robert Gerard, a disciple of um, Arnold Schoenberg, had opted for the cerebral abstract path of Dodecaphony and Mumpo, 12 note composition, and Mumpo unwilling to enable or unwilling or unable to abandon his instinctive, sensitive approach to music. He had the feeling, Mumpo had the feeling that history was advancing in a different direction to him. Added to this aesthetic malaise was violence and political chaos. In 1938, at the height of the Spanish Civil War, when a nationalist victory and the cultural repression that would follow were increasingly apparent, Mumpo harmonized one of Catalonia's saddest traditional songs, the Testament d'Amelia, or Amelia's Testament. It tells the story of a dying princess, Amelia, speaking to her mother on her deathbed. In a terrifying twist of events, not only do we discover that the mother is responsible for her poisoning, but that she's also taken Amelia's husband as her lover. It's a horrifying story of family dissolution, the rupture of most basic bonds, of the old killing the young, and of lives sacrificed upon the altar of lies and deceit, in short, of war. In 1939, when nationalist rebel soldiers entered Barcelona, they put an immediate end to its autonomous institutions. They publicly burned thousands of Catalan books. They tore down the entire cultural system that had, that had been created. The country's language lost its official status for 40 years. 
whereas before the war there was a flourishing public world of newspapers, publishing houses, and all manner of cultural events, in its aftermath this structure was uprooted and an era of forced cultural assimilation and linguistic substitution began. Upon the ruins, the regime promoted a new culture in Castilian with the collaboration of Catalans who preferred peace to liberty. Forty years of Francoist hegemony silenced or reinterpreted a large part of the preceding period's accomplishments. This explains why, even today, many people are ignorant of the relationship that Gaudí, Mupo, Miró, or Dalí had with their context, and subsequently of the precise, palpable meaning behind their work. It's a frank reminder of why in Catalonia liberating yourself from the Francoist legacy means reconnecting with the world from before the civil war. In 1939, Catalan culture forked like never before. Hundreds of intellectuals went into exile. Some of the most important works of Catalan literature from the mid 20th century were written abroad, in France, in Switzerland, in Mexico, and often in a state of isolation and disconnection, as, in the case with, as is the case with Marcelo Dureda's novels and the short stories of Pedacaudes. At this point, previous aspirations tied to the name of Greece seemed insignificant, a wounded fly squashed under the soldier's boot. But the Hellenic vision was still an attractive force, something that's clear in the life and work of the poet and humanist, Carlos Arriba. <clears throat> In 1939, Riva crossed the border with his life, the poet Clementina Dari, and their three children. Their first stop was Avignon, where Riva felt the fatigue of a thousand years, he wrote. But by March, they were settled in Moulin du Chateau in Biaville, a few kilometers south of Paris. Despite their desperate situation, Riva did what he could to put a brave face on things even writing to a friend, I don't think it's necessary to hold my head in my hands just yet. The gods only look fondly on the happy. The gods only look fondly on the happy. He learned from written correspondence with family that he was public enemy number one in Spain and that his books had been banned. Something he wrote that offers me sweet revenge for my reputation as incomprehensible. And it was in this state of mind that he found himself under Nazi occupation in France. When Gestapo officers called on him, Riva managed to fob them off by telling, by telling them how much he admired German culture and by showing them the books by Goethe, Hölderlin, and Rilke that he was translating. The humanist convictions that had always accompanied Riva now revealed themselves with greater urgency than ever. For him, humanism and democracy were inseparable, were inseparable principles. And it was during this period, where he was barely able to meet his most basic material needs, that he expressed these ideas for the first time in verse. <clears throat> The result was a series of elegies that stand not only as the high point in his poetic trajectory, but as a monument to European poetry in those hours of totalitarian darkness. Riva managed to get the verses to friends in Catalonia by signing his letters with a French name and writing them in French, posing as an old engineer or teacher from France. They were received by small faith groups made up of young dissidents that would then copy and circulate them clandestinely with considerable impact within the cultural resistance. The homeland, he wrote to the young poet Rosa Lavaroni, the homeland is a circle, wide, narrow, it does not matter. 
is a circle where our word constitutes action, connecting with the echoes and the wonder of the unknown voices of the innumerable, of, of the innumerable dead. It's a wonderful description of what a homeland is. A homeland is a, homeland is a circle where our word constitutes action, connecting with the echoes and the wonder of the unknown voices of the dead. The poems that form uh, his book, Elegias de Bierville, Bierville Elegies, elevated the conflict that Catalans had just experienced to the universal realm where the Greeks' struggle against the Persians was the first in a long succession of battles in the name of freedom. In the ninth elegy, the poet evokes the battle of Salamis before addressing the Greeks directly and declaring himself as among the sons of your illustrious Saul. The Greeks had shown the world, Riva wrote, that freedom conquered in the impassioned search for what is true and what is just is the patrimony of humanity. And it was for this very reason that born of the hope emanating from all exiles, the beaten shall become soldiers once again. The beaten shall become soldiers once more. It was a proud and defiant message that could only be formulated in exile, and when it reached occupied Catalonia, it caused shock waves. Meanwhile, Catalan culture was slowly rebuilding itself within an atmosphere of resistance and collaboration through clandestine publications, secret meetings in private homes, and by exploiting cracks in the censorship. Each individual artist search, searched for their own way to reconnect with their environment. Frédéric Mumpau had yet to overcome, to overcome his personal crisis. In 1941, he met the young pianist Carme Bravo, whose presence proved providential. One night, after an insipid concert at the Palau de la Musica, they decided to take a stroll along the streets around the cathedral in the old town of Barcelona. As they approached the Gothic fountain in the courtyard to the Casa de la Diaca, a Gothic building, the bells chimed midnight. We can imagine the sensuality of the moment, the stimulating company, the expressive power of the water song, the bells that had so inspired him as a boy in his grandfather's foundry, the streets' nocturnal repose after their daily desecration by military boots. All of that transmuted into a gentle, evocative music, and suddenly Mumpo rediscovered the strength to creatively embrace his city once again. The vibration of water and air, his old receptiveness for the unexpected, the search for the essential, all of it melted into a new composition, the fountain and the bell. The piece signaled Mumpo's creative rebirth, but we can also regard it as a collective revival. The subtle piece of music asserted that war and the dictatorship had been powerless to kill memory and life. As a result, the piece can be considered an emblem for all the artists who remained in Catalonia and lived under the Franco regime. <clears throat> I'm afraid I will have to finish here. Unfortunately, I don't have enough time to explain everything that comes afterwards. The only thing I will say is that, in large part, the story of Catalan culture in the second half of the 20th century is one of reconnection and reconstruction, a lengthy, slow process that is still ongoing. Even today, as Catalans are often left, uh, even today, uh, as Catalans, we are often left surprised and outraged by all the basic things we don't know about our own history. I've spoken, I've spoken about Greece and the terra, about elevation and rootedness, as well as the aspiration, on the one hand, to converse on an equal footing with all of humanity, and on the other hand, to work with and within a place, to recognize even the loveliest things around you as marvelous, and to alchemically transform them into gold. 
standing before you today, these two tendencies seem more valid to me than ever. We live in a globalized planet under tremendous standardizing forces, while also witnessing the consequences of our brutal exploitation of the environment. The creative tradition that I've attempted to evoke almost seems to have been devised in response to this exact situation. I won't go as far as Gaudi and declare Catalonia the new center of the world, but I will leave you by expressing my faith in the fecundity of this particular sensibility, of this Catalan fusion of ambition and respect of localism and universality. As Maragall asserted, the most universal phenomenon is unequivocal difference. And it's out of these unequivocal differences that, as the philosophy of Trancadiz shows us, that precious realities are born. Thank you very much. I don't know if there are questions or commentaries or no, anything. No, we need no? some greetings in the YouTube uh, chat channel. So, uh -huh. um, if there are no questions here from our live uh, guests and listeners, I will uh, thank you very, very much for this inspiring talk uh, for many. Um, interesting and exciting ideas and links and connections to ancient Greece um, and, and to this uh, contemporary project of Alani. And uh, thanks a lot for also for your faith and uh, for, for all the uh, wonderful ideas. Uh, um, yes, I, I have here some clapping hands. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> so, um. Thank you very much. So thank you for inviting me. It was a pleasure. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>